Um, so I will also start with saying that there are quite a few people on here. So I just want to mention there's probably a various um, range of people, uh, people's knowledge uh, with respect to iNaturalist. So, um, you know, there may be some beginners is what I'm thinking and as well as some quite experienced users. So um, I'm going to try to cater to the, the, the breadth of what we have here. But um, so I know for those that are, you know, know iNaturalist quite well, parts of this will, will probably be a bit repetitious uh, to what you already know. So moving along. Uh, there we go. Um, so there's been a lot of reports uh, around the world um, about wildlife showing up in odd areas. Um, some of these are uh, somewhat exaggerated and some have been um, um, proven to either be a little bit exaggerated, but some of them are, are quite legit. So um, it's possible with you know reduced human presence out uh, out and about. Um, people are staying home through isolation, through physical distancing. Um, when um, the which would you know when we're out and about, we normally might scare off the wildlife that would be in and around us. So um, in this current situation with people moving around less, um, the animals, wildlife may be uh, a little less wary and feel a bit more secure to, to show up. Um, what it's mostly going to relate to is uh, kind of the more generalist species. So things like raccoons and skunks, uh, crows, things that are kind of adapt well adapted to human being in, an, in and around a human environment already. Um, so we should think about this though, not as you know, wildlife populations are increasing um, and not that you know, nature is rebounding or rewilding. Um, that's just, we're looking at much too short of a time frame right now for, for that to be actually the case. But um, more so it's probably like that species that are already around may be more visible. So they're like, as I mentioned, they're less scared off. Um, and some species that are often out at night may feel a little more safe in the daytime than we might see them a little bit more as well in the day. Um, but we have to remember that, like, our, that our, our human footprint is still here. So our roads are still here, even though there's less traffic. Our, our buildings and our cities act as physical barriers to movement. Um, dams, large and small, are also still barriers. So, so our, our physical footprint is, is still here. Um, that said, though, uh, we may see some small scale benefits. Uh, we're hearing uh, and temporary, like a, a small blip in, in benefits to um, uh, wildlife. Um, air quality in some areas of the globe have actually has actually improved. Um, we're looking at, uh, you know, as, as wildlife come out from uh, hibernation, uh, things are starting to move around with less vehicles and less traffic on the road. We're looking at potentially less um, um, road mortality. Uh, we have a project on the go in Eastern Ontario looking at turtles and road mortality and we found over 1,400 uh, turtles killed in just the Ottawa area alone in, in over a span of three years. So they're not really on the move that much just yet, uh, but if this continues, which is uh, unfortunate for all of us um, people and our, our, there's you know, large impacts to our society, um, there may be some small benefits to, uh, to some populations like that. So what this does, as I said, given you know this is an extremely unfortunate um, situation for for a lot of us, uh, and it's it's difficult times for many people in the globe. Um, but, but what it does do is it gives us an opportunity to catch a catch a glimpse of what maybe a lessened human impact on nature, as far as our movement goes and our vehicle go, vehicle traffic goes, um, what that could do for nature, um, and maybe rethink our relationship with our with our natural world. Um, and one way to see this unfold is looking at iNaturalist. So um, bringing me to my, what the main focus of the, this discussion, this webinar. Um, so iNaturalist is a global network uh, run by the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco and National Geographic. Um, so this, this global um, network with all these specific countries that have their own iteration. Uh, basically, it's a database of wildlife observations that are that are amassed across the globe. 
Um, there are, I think, about nine countries right now on this map, and there's another three or four that are in the works. Um, so it's really, really taken off quite well. Uh, as far as Canada goes, um, as I said, it's a, it's a database of observations, but they're observations created by everyday people, uh, as well as scientists, um, birders, naturalists, parents, and youth. Um, and it's a way for people to take a photo of wildlife, anything they see that's alive um, and in the natural environment, um, and upload it for others to see and identify. We had just over 2 million observations in Canada just at the end of last summer. Um, so we're pretty excited for the number of observ observations and amount of uh, species that are being seen. Um, the photo on the right is the top um, most observed species. So we're seeing uh, quite a number of things that we might expect to see, uh, Canada geese and uh, the mallards and monarchs, which are uh, actually species at risk, which is interesting to be one of the top ones, um, but um, also quite visible and quite noteworthy to see. Um, so what it, there's a, there are a couple of, so there's adding observations, but there's also a, an educational learning aspect um, to this as well. So um, one way that iNaturalist provides a, um, a tool, a benefit, is to learn what's around us. Um, so if we can't get out of our houses right now, uh, we can take a virtual wildlife field trip. So we can explore what's been observed and what's being observed around in our neighborhood, in our uh, town, in our province. Um, or if we are able to get out um, and planning to get outside, uh, you, can, you can browse observations and check to see what you might come across. You can see what people have seen uh, currently in the recent times, uh, people, what people have seen at this exact same time last year to get a sense of what might be out and about in your neighborhood. So to figure this out, if you click on the Explore tab, so this is a, a screenshot of the website. Uh, if you click the Explore tab on the website, uh, it brings you to this map of Canada and um, it is a heat map. So all the kind of darker red areas are, oranger areas, are where more species of, or more observations have been made. And not surprisingly, it pretty much coincides with some of the more populated areas of the country. Um, but within this, you can search along the bar there, in the top bar, uh, by species, by species group, uh, like turtles or um, butterflies, or more specific, something like orchids. Uh, you can also search by location, so right in a place where, you th where you're interested in. If you click the gray filters bar as well, you have a few other search options. So you can see which ones uh, are research grade, so which, ones have, which means they've been verified by others. Uh, you can search a specific day or a date range um, and look for um, what's been seen uh, in a given time frame. And as you zoom in, um, this is what you would see as a, at a more local level. So each one of these um, dots and pins uh, is an observation made by somebody. And they're color coded by a species group. So our um, blue dots are vertebrates, um, the red are insects, and plants are in green. Now, if you click on any one of these specific dots, um, it will give you a bit more information of what the actual species is. And a, you could hover over the the person who identified and see who it was. It gives you the date um, and the recent and the um, um, area generally of where the species was seen. Clicking on the actual species brings you to the species page. So this is the actual observation of what somebody saw. And uh, if you scroll down on the website, you'll be able to see more information on the identification of it, some comments if anybody else has commented on the observation, as well as um, some of the more um, specific information on the location of this. So that's one way to learn about you know, what might be seen in your neighborhood. Now what uh, about when you do see something? So another way um, that this uh, can help is through the auto identification feature. Um, I should mention, so, so both these ways to learn, I mean, this is great for um, you know, people, adults to learn, a great way to also educate your kids and other adults on, on what's been seen around you. And so it's kind of, it can play a bit of a, a hide and seek or scavenger hunt type game of uh, what's been, what you might think be, is living in your neighborhood. So as I mentioned, when you see something, um, another part of uh, education tool that this provides is uh, auto identification. So this actually is a, um, 
computer um, software that does image recognition and it can actually help identify what it is you just took a photo of. This is available in the app as well as online at inaturalist.ca. And um, what it does is it looks at the photo of to, to compare visually similar species, but it also filters out um, species specific to your area. So uh, if it's things that have been seen completely farther away, it will it'll likely remove some of those observations from what this species likely could be. Um, so if you're you know, wondering what the insect might be on your flower, uh, bird at your bird feeder, you can always take a photo and it'll give, help uh, provide suggestions on, on what this is. Uh, I should put, put in the caveat that, you know, of course, this isn't 100% accurate all of the time. Uh, it's kind of a starting place and it gives species suggestions on what it might be. It takes some thought and some looking into it to figure out what species it actually is. Um, some stats have been run on this software and it figures that about 85% uh, of the time, the species would be one of these top 10 that are, that are showing up. So it's not bad, but it's also not perfect. Um, you can also click on these uh, species that pop up as well to get other photos of them, get some information about the species, to make your own judgment call of what you think it actually is. Second level of help in identification is the community. So across the globe, there are about 800,000 people that are using iNaturalist globally. We have about 50, oh, about 60,000 people in Canada, um, but the 800,000 have the ability to, to see your observation and comment on it. So on the left is the auto identification that I was showing, on the right is the community identification. So these people saw this observation, looked at it and said, oh, I think it's this and here's why. Um, and it can start a bit of a discussion on um, what this, uh, about the species, what it is, and, and why it might be interesting. This is actually a species at risk in Ontario as well. Um, if you'll note on the top, there's a green flag that says research grade. So this means basically that enough people in the community on iNaturalist uh, have agreed with uh, each other essentially to say that yes, we think this is a great rat snake. And it basically works on a two thirds majority. So uh, the two thirds all agree, uh, and then it becomes a research grade. So it's a way to look at observations and thinking of which ones are potentially more credible um, on iNaturalist, or at least that have been verified by somebody else. So how it all works. Um, now I'm going to get into a bit about um, getting out and using the app and uh, or digital camera to take photos and uploading them on iNaturalist.ca. Um, of course, especially in these current times, just make sure as we're going out to always follow you know, our local, provincial and national health regulations to make sure we're abiding by um, being safe and, and uh, in this time. Um, another thing to mention as well is this is designed to take photos of wild species. I mean, they could be things on your, you know, on your garden plants, on your um, balcony um, potted plants. Um, but the idea is to try and get as much as possible to get um, wild species that aren't captive or cultivated. So I'm going to give you a break from me talking for a second and you can listen to a video uh, that we've put together, which also actually though uh, involves me talking on the video. So get a bit of a break, but not really. Hang on one second, I'll bring this up. I don't know if they're seeing it. You've installed the iNaturalist app and created an account. Now you're ready to make a valuable contribution to conservation. So people can hear Every this, photo right? or sound recording is a record of a living thing that can be used to quantify biodiversity, track invasive species, locate species at risk, and much more. Evidence of any living thing, like a plant, animal, fungus, tracks, or sound recording can be an observation on iNaturalist. Once you find something you'd like to record, just tap Observe on iPhones or the green plus for Androids. You can choose to take a photo, choose no photo, or on some devices, record a sound. Check to see if sound recording is an option in your device. If you're observing something that is better captured with a digital camera, like needing a zoom for a faraway bird or a macro lens for an insect, you can take a placeholder photo in the app or choose no photo and add the digital picture later 
by editing your observation on the iNaturalist.ca website. This gives the benefit of capturing the date, location, and any notes while on site, and adding a better photo later. If you're taking a photo with a mobile device, you can review your picture once done and tap Next or OK if it looks good. To identify it, hit What did you see? If you have internet connection, iNaturalist will suggest visually similar species and the species group it belongs to. You can choose one of those or write the species name in yourself. It's okay if you don't know what it is. You can simply add the general group like lichens and people in the iNaturalist community can help you identify it. If you don't have an internet connection, one option is to come back to edit this observation later once you have internet again. On the observation details screen, you can add more photos of the same organism or write a note. This could include details that might help others confirm your identification. The date, time, and location should be automatically added. If they aren't, check the location services in the settings of your device. You can also change the geo privacy of the observation. Open will allow others on iNaturalist to see the location. Obscured will randomly buffer the true location or private will ensure that it doesn't show up on any maps. Mark whether it's captive or cultivated, or add it to a project. Once you're finished, tap share on your iPhone or the check mark for Android, and your observation will be uploaded for everyone to see and identify. You can uncheck the automatic upload box in the app settings. If, for example, you would like to go back and edit your observations before they are submitted to iNaturalist. In this case, observations are stored on your device until you manually hit upload. like from the comments that I had back everybody was able to see that so that's good um, success um, so a couple of things I want to mention about the app uh, to re reiterate uh, it does it, we do say in there that it does work offline so uh, if you don't have data or internet on your phone then you can um, uh, store them on your phone as you take your photos and then come back where you have internet connection and upload them up after the fact um, I should also mention as well that the app is available on iOS, so iPhones and iPads, as well as Android devices. Um, the other thing to think about, um, so as, as mentioned in the video, so um, the um, some things don't lend themselves well to be taken with a phone camera, so something you need to zoom in, zoom for, or maybe a better um, better focus on a, on a species. So what I tend to do in the field or when I'm out and about is to, if I need something with a digital camera, I'll either take a placeholder um, picture with the app so that it pulls the location so I don't have to try and remember exactly where I was. Um, or you can take an observation without a photo and then when you um, go back into the app, if you don't have the auto upload, when you go back to the app, you can edit that observation right into the app. Um, if you can get the photo onto your smartphone or you can upload them onto the internet on the website and then go into the and edit it after the fact and you'll see how to do that in a second. Um, and as I said, so the brings me to the next option of uploading um, photos that you have taken with the digital camera. So once you have uh, taken a photo with the digital camera and you have it then onto you go back home, you, you put it onto your computer, um, then you head to iNaturalist.ca and you can upload the picture directly onto the website. To do this, you go to iNaturalist.ca, uh, you log in if you have an existing account. If you don't, you can sign up. Um, one thing to, to mention and to, to that I'd like everybody to think about is that we want to have people affiliate to iNaturalist Canada, as opposed to, I mentioned, there's the global network, so default might be to, to sign into iNaturalist.org. Um, the idea of going to iNaturalist Canada, for one, it's bilingual. It's a bilingual site, so it's available in French and English. Um, also, it caters the information you get um, through the app or on the website to just Canadian species. 
Um, and it also gives uh, researchers, Canadian researchers, more access to the data, to the actual locations of some of these observations. So it makes it a lot easier for us to use this information for, for research. So once you click log in, um, this will bring you to what's called your dashboard. So this is like your home page screen with a bunch of information specific to your uh, content. Um, you can also get here at any point when you've signed in by clicking on the icon of yourself in the upper right hand corner, which is up here. Um, and so um, from here, you can see your observations, only the ones you've submitted. You can see comments that people have put on your observations. You can go to your account settings, which is where you would be able to change your affiliation to affiliate to iNaturalist Canada if you want, um, and any projects you might have joined. Uh, you also can see who you're following. So there's a bit an ability to follow people on iNaturalist, so friends and see what they're posting and get notices about that. Um, so I'm gonna try this again and break to another video that explains exactly how to ob uh, upload an observation on the website. And it should come up right there. Let's go right through to the part where I talk about that. To get to the uploader, click on the green uploader button in the header. And from here, drag and drop the files you want to add or choose from the menu. Once you've dragged in your photos and sounds, iNaturalist will e import each one as a card in the workspace here. Keep in mind, the photos have not been added as observations in iNaturalist just yet. That won't happen until you hit the green submit button in the upper right hand corner. We recommend not adding more than about 50 files at a time into the uploader page. Now that your observation cards are all in your workspace, you can start editing their information. You can edit a single observation by clicking on it here and entering the information directly on the card or in this area on the left hand side. You'll see that geo privacy, captive cultivated, tags, projects and observation fields are all on the left hand side as well. For geo privacy, open will allow others on iNaturalist to see the location. Obscured will randomly buffer the true location, or private will ensure that it doesn't show up on any maps. To add an identification, click on the species name field, and iNaturalist will suggest visually similar species. Or you can type in a common or scientific name and choose from the drop down menu. There's no sound recording software on iNaturalist, so you'll have to type in the species name. To add or edit location information, click on the location space here. You'll see that a location editor pops up, and you can type a place into the search bar at the top. Note that this will not search iNaturalist curated places, rather it's a Google Maps name search. And from here, you can pick a point and drag these control dots on the circle to show the accuracy level of your location. Once you're done, click on update observation to get back to your workspace. If you often make observations at the same location, such as a local park or your backyard, you can save it to your account as a pinned location. Once you have the correct coordinates, accuracy, geo privacy settings, and notes in these fields, click on the pin button. Location will be saved. You can access it by clicking on your pinned locations right here. Now, these two photos are the same organism, so you would want to combine them into one observation. You can either select them both and click combine up at the top, or drag one card onto the other, and there you go. They've been merged into one. The date was stored in the photo's properties, which iNaturalist has read. And if the photo was taken with a mobile device or digital camera with a built-in GPS, the location will also be automatically added. If not, check the location services on your device. These locations will not have an accuracy though, so it is very important to manually add that in. Otherwise, we can't know if you are at the observation or perhaps several hundred meters away. Finally, let's say you want to batch edit your cards. You can select certain cards with your mouse or click select all at the top. Once you've selected all the observations you'd like to edit, you can use the forms on the left-hand side to do so. Anything you enter on the left-hand side will affect all the cards you have selected. Now that you've edited everything you want to, 
You just have to hit submit and they will be added to your account and the iNaturalist database. So I think that worked as well. Um, so a couple of things to, to mention with respect to that. Uh, as I mentioned, um, digital cameras, most digital cameras don't have GPS. Uh, some, some actually do though, uh, in which case you would get an actual coordinate uh, from your uh, photo that's stored in the photo properties. Uh, and if you're a bit tech savvy, some cameras are able to sync with a smartphone to be able to use the cell phone's GPS as well in it. But as, as I mentioned, that you might, uh, that hopefully everybody caught, is that these won't have an accuracy. So it'll just leave that blank. And then it's impossible to know exactly where you were. So even if, even if it's right and the actual coordinates are accurate and or that you know are accurate, other people that are looking at that can't tell if you were there or if maybe you just had a wonky GPS signal and we're you know, even a couple kilometers away. We're, we're getting that in iNaturalist with some of the data. So that's, that's something really important to keep in mind. Um, so you can edit that in the in the observation details as we saw. Um, you can also choose sound files the same way as as it was shown in that video. So you can either drag and drop. So if you have your file files open, you can drag, select your photos. You can select a sound the same way. You drag them all onto that screen and drop them on the uploader screen, and they'll all come in there. Um, or you can do the file search and click through your directory and click the uh, the the files that you want to add in. Um, also to bear in mind, so for sound recordings, most tablets uh, and smartphones will have sound recording apps already installed in them. So for taking sound recordings of certain things, it's, uh, you can just open that up and save a file that way. Um, so that's a pretty quick overview of how to add an observation. So now, you know, what are we going to go and look for? So, and how are we going to contribute to this? Um, again, I should, you know, mention that you know, bear in mind of the times we're in and make sure that we're um, physically distant according to, our, to the guidelines that are being given out in your area. Um, and, but these things, these things I'm going to talk about are, are also relevant at any other time of, of the year as well on uh, what to think about taking photos of. Um, so in this current time, you know, if we're in our house, we can keep an eye on our bird feeder. Now, this bird feeder photo isn't all that useful, and so as mentioned, I think in one of the videos, um, much better off to get a bit closer. So if you can get a zoom on a camera or, or get closer from your window, we want to actually be able to see the species. Um, also keep an eye on your windowsills. I've had uh, several butterflies come to my window and, and just taking photos like that. Uh, and you can also look inside your house. Not everybody likes to see spiders in their house, but it is an opportunity to take a photo of something that um, maybe people wouldn't think to include as an observation on a naturalist. Um, and then also when it's as uh, out and around your house, and I mean, bearing, depending on where you are and, and your ability to get outside too much, but things from a balcony work as well. Um, seeing you know, bats or other species on, um, uh, patio umbrella, um, squirrels and chipmunks are, are in and about pretty much everywhere across the country to be able to take photos of. Um, and the other thing I've, I've found is, is leaving lights on at night uh, will attract moths. Uh, so when you come back from a, an evening stroll or leave a light on and poke your head out the door at some point in the evening, um, something that will also help is if you have a spot where you can put a white cloth, uh, like a white sheet as well, will attract the moths as well and you can take photos, photos that way. Um, now, if you're able to get outside of your home, um, you can have a look at your garden. As I mentioned, we're not looking for cultivated plants, though, um, but uh, there's lots of things that might visit these. So either a garden or, you know, potted plants on a balcony as well, pollinators will be coming to visit those. Um, so have a look a little closer. Look at the flowers, see if you have any bees or other pollinators on your flowers. Check the underside of the leaves. Um, these monarch on the left, uh, we're visiting milkweed uh, in our yard at one point. Um, so uh, yeah, have a look underneath on the undersides of leaves too to, to poke around. Uh, now, if it's safe to do so, and you can do so uh, on your own or with families, you can head out on a nice quiet family walk. <laughs> um, 
when you're out walking around, some things to kind of keep in mind uh, is to um, you know look look under logs, under rocks. You'll you may find some uh, salamanders, depending on where you are. Uh, insects for sure. Um, you can look for uh, look under logs. You can look for tracks. There's not much snow left around these days, but uh, tracks in the mud. Uh, iNaturalist actually will uh, accept. Like we can accept. We accept any. It's called evidence of what you've seen. So tracks are evidence of something having been there. Um, and vision, the image recognition software is starting to do okay on tracks. There's not a lot of track photos, so there's not a lot to train the, the software on. Um, but it's it gives some ideas. Uh, you can also listen for bird calls um, to record. Uh, also birds on hydro wires or other areas to take photos of. Um, frogs are starting to call in most areas of Canada. If they haven't all yet, already yet, they will be. Um, so I find getting a sound recording of frog is one of the best way to um, upload observations of frogs. And uh, we have a, a project specifically looking at the um, the chorus frog as well to track locations of this uh, species at risk. So if you're hearing frogs calling, you can uh, start recording. Um, also, think about getting close up at the you know on tree trunks for lichens, for mosses, and uh, fungi as well. Um, also, as I mentioned with a bird feeder, um, it's much better to get close and take some more distinguishing features. Um, this is an identifiable tree from a photo, but it's not always that easy when you get a, a photo of a tree that's, that's in, a, in a distance. And then on top of that, saying that I swear I saw a bird in the tree right there, um, it's pretty hard to identify if you're that far out. So try and get close. That's where I zoom might work really well with a digital camera. Um, other things to think about is think about the key features. Again, you know, a distant shot of this bush isn't uh, isn't very easily to, uh, identifiable, and others can't really confirm it all that easy. So think about identifying features like the the fruit or seed of a of a tree if you can get close and get the photos of that, and a uh, close up of the leaf. That's much more identifiable, and people can uh, can actually help you identify it if you don't know what it is, but also can confirm if you do know what it is. Um, and think about multiple angles. Um, so this upper side of this mushroom, um, a trick to use if we're trying to get the underside is to um, flip your camera around, uh, like to use the selfie camera or the you know, forward facing camera and you can set it up underneath and take a photo by looking down on your screen and, and getting the, the photo from the underside. Um, things like mushrooms are often needed needing the underside to, to get a uh, positive identification. Same thing for lichens. Um, but thinking about multiple angles goes you know beyond beyond mushrooms and lichens. Um, things like frogs we need to see the the ridge on the back of a, of a frog or the stripe along an eye. Um, to be able to confirm it. Butterflies often have uh, a different pattern on the top wing versus the underside. Um, and if you're, um, if you're brave and inclined, the bellies of snakes uh, are, or salamanders are, are, can be telling for, for species identification. Um, another thing to think about is old photos. You know, if, if you're just getting going on an or or uh, have some time on your hands now, um, then you can go back through Digital photos. I mean, these they probably won't look like these ones here, but uh, more like a list of, of files in a folder you haven't opened for a while. But um, if you're able to find out, uh, pull in some digital photos that you've taken in the past, and provided you can render a, a decent idea of where you were at the time to add a, a location there, um, this might be an opportune time to, to open these up. Um, the other way to contribute as well is if you happen to know species identification or even just one species, um, there's an identify button along the top bar of iNaturalist that will open up all the observations and photos that need to be confirmed still. So you can contribute by going through uh, other people's observations to give them a hand on identifying things and contribute to uh, improving the, the quality of observations and the identifications that are on there. And now, so now that we've got a handle on, on the app and the website and what to take photos of, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this does provide, as, as difficult these times are, um, we still, there's still an opportunity to connect with nature and with others uh, observing wildlife around us. So thinking, you know, in this time of physical distancing and isolation, um, 
and these are difficult times for mo many of us, um, there's also kind of a unique global experiment that's going on that's never before been possible, um, which is to see how, you know, what reduced human movement, uh, how that impacts the wildlife around us. So a way to, to capture that is we've created this project in iNaturalist.ca, uh, in iNaturalist Canada, um, called Observations from Isolation. So um, how it works is it, it for those that, are, that join the project, is going to automatically add your observations to this project. And we can keep track of what people are seeing from their homes, on their, their solo walks, on their outings with their families, in their yards and balconies, um, to see what's happening with wildlife in their areas. So make sure if you're interested in this, to click the Join button on the top, on the right-hand side, so that it will actually add uh, all your observations. Um, through this as well, we're going to be posting um, other ways for people to connect with nature uh, in the newsfeed of the project. So if you've joined, then you'll get these updates through the newsfeed um, that'll be sent to your email or through your dashboard uh, on an Agilist. Um, and you can also connect with others in the comment section uh, of these posts. You can also connect with others in, in, like I said, to follow people. So if you click on somebody's profile, you can follow them and you'll see what they're posting and what they're up to uh, with respect to what they're observing. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a, a so to, to get to this project, I should say, to find projects, um, if you click the top bar uh, in community, uh, there'll be a projects option there. You click that projects and um, it will bring you to this landing page. Um, you can also do so through the app. If you click the, the, the menu bar in the app and then projects, it'll show nearby projects. Um, it will actually show up as one of these featured projects that you're seeing um, next time you open the website or the app. Um, but if you're not seeing it, you can also search observations from isolation and it'll show up in the, in the menu. You can click on that to get to it. Um, so as we're, as we're thinking about these observations and what's being seen around, um, you know, whether it's, you know, whether it's an increase in wildlife present, which, you know, could be, um, or whether we're just around and have the time to notice what's living around our, our homes and in our neighborhoods, um, it remains to be seen. I think it's a bit, probably a bit of both. Um, but to really know this, we need information on it. We need to know what people are being or are seeing and what's around. So reporting on that um, will give us the information to, to figure this out. And the information on a naturalist um, also is um, available to researchers to, to, to see all of this. So it will actually help us answer this, this question. Um, one other way in which we are um, connecting, uh, helping Canadians connect with uh, nature is if, if you check out um, our website, cwf-fcf.org, um, we have some tips and resources on, uh, on the website on how to further connect with nature in these times of, of physical distancing and, and isolation. Um, also today kicks off National Wildlife Week. Um, so each day we'll feature a uh, different theme and suggest uh, a selection of actions that people can take to, um, as we're calling it, be one with nature. Uh, there's a way to enter a contest to do as many of these as possible. Um, so that's a way we can kind of encourage everyone and get involved and get in, engaged in something kind of fun and, and um, changing our, our minds out a little bit as well with what, everything people are dealing with. Um, there's also a webinar coming up on Wednesday this week about wildlife friendly gardening. So if you search uh, Eventbrite for it or Google uh, CWF webinars, you'll be able to find the page uh, that way. Uh, also the City Nature Challenge is coming up uh, at the end of this month. It's much more reduced because of um, all the distancing. It was originally going to get people together and out observing things using iNaturalist recording as many uh, observations as people's, people can see within specific cities that are competing across the country and around the globe. Um, it's definitely more reduced now, so we're just basically encouraging people um, to get out and explore, uh, get out as much as possible or from, from your, you know, the safety of, of where you can be um, to be able to um, record observations and, and have a fun, uh, fun way to connect with other people around, uh, around Canada and in other cities and across the, the globe. So that ends my um, discussion about iNaturalist and what to take photos of, how to upload. Um, I haven't been able to keep an eye on the, the questions, so I'm going to do a real quick 
search through some of the questions that have been popping in, and it seems like there are a few. So um, I am going to uh, pull some of those up. So uh, in no particular order, uh, I'm going to go through a few of these as I'm seeing them. Uh, good question about the app. So where can I find the app? Um, we're only finding the US one. Uh, yes, it is just one app. One app. So iNaturalist is the app. Um, it, it's set to recognize the country that we are that you are in when you open it up. So when you open the app up in Canada, it will ask you for if you open it for the when you open it for the first time, it will ask you if you want to affiliate to iNaturalist.ca um, because it recognizes your phone is in Canada. So there is just one app. We want uh, everybody to use the iNaturalist app. When you're going through the website, is where we would recommend going to iNaturalist.ca. Um, can you upload sound clips in the app? You can if your Android right now supports uh, recording a sound, as if you maybe saw in the um, in the video. Um, the so the same way you add an object observation, the little pop up will say, "Do you want to take photo, record a sound, or choose a photo or sound that's already on your device?" Um, so you can do it that way through the app if you already have a recorded sound on your device or if you're standing beside a bird and you're listening to it, you can tap record, it'll open up your sound recorder. When you're done, you, you end your sound recording and it'll pull it in automatically. Um, iOS, or, or it's, it's, it's in the works to, to roll out, so it's not quite on uh, iPhones yet, but the, um, it will be coming. So that there will be an option to do it through the app. Um, but yes, as well, you can do it online. Um, okay, uh, sorry, I'm just scrolling through some of these other um, good question about um, location information. Um, so as I was mentioning, the uh, locations are obscured or hidden for automatically for some species. So these are species that are what we're calling subject to persecution and harm. So things that would be if their true location was known, are likely to be either poached or persecuted for various reasons. Um, those are automatically hidden in iNaturalist from the general public to see. Um, being the, the, the developers behind iNaturalist Canada, um, those of us, the, ourselves, Parks Canada, Nature Surf Canada, and Royal Ontario Museum, do get the true locations of those observations. Um, in particular, Nature Surf Canada is the overarching um, network of all the provincial conservation data centers. And those provincial conservation data centers um, track and house the data on species at risk occurrences across the country. This inver information is actually then used by um, species experts who make decisions on which species are um, deemed to be at risk in Canada. So the Committee on the Status of Endangered Wildlife in Canada, um, they use the conservation data centers, and more and more, they're also going directly to iNaturalist uh, Canada to get this information. Um, so uh, if somebody makes the location private, though, uh, we do not see that. Um, that will be actually hide the observations from the map. Um, the general public can't see that. The way we do get that, though, is if you're affiliated to Canada, which is why I was suggesting people do that, is we get the data cut to only be used for specific research purposes. We do not share that. We can't provide it to anyone else unless under a specific um, data request and uh, agreement. But um, we would see the private locations um, for, for researchers, for research purposes. Um, and as I mentioned, yes, we can definitely upload uh, photos from the past, from last year. If we know the location, um, even the date, I mean, plus or minus, and location, if you're not sure exactly where you were, you can leave, as, it, as we saw, the accuracy, you can leave that buffer um, quite wide, uh, just to capture that, you know, you know it's generally around there, but not exactly sure of the, um, of the actual um, location. Um, there are questions about um, once uh, pictures taken, can you replace it with a better one? Um, yes, definitely. I mentioned that a bit with the, about the placeholder option. So um, when you take a photo, if you you'll see it in it right away, and it'll ask if you like it. Basically, ask if you click OK, it'll upload it to that or link it to that observation. If you don't like it, you can click retry and take another photo right then. If you don't think you can get a better photo um, with your device, 
you can accept the photo you took. It'll kind of keep it in that, save with that observation. Um, then if you have your digital camera and you can get a better photo with that, you can record it with your digital camera and your, that, and taking a photo with your cell phone or your, your device will actually will help kind of trigger your memory of what species it is linked to that location. Now, when you get back to your house or office um, and you upload your observations to the website and then take your files from your digital camera and put them on your, just on your computer. Now, when you go back to your account on iNaturalist, then you um, can click that observation itself, click edit, and then go find uh, your observation that you have, your photo that you have in your files on your computer and also add it. Um, there's a spot when you open up the observation, there's a right at the top where the photo is, right below the photo, it will say, um, add another photo. You can click that and that's where it'll bring up a search um, a window and then you can search through your computer to add the extra, the extra photo. And you can delete the original one at that point if you want to. Um, bear in mind as well, whichever one that shows as being your first, there's a checkbox beside it and that's the one that people will see when they click your observation. Um, so you'll want to have your better photo as the one that has a little check underneath it so that that's what people see. Otherwise, they'll see the blurry one and then not know maybe to check if there's other photos and see the, the better ones. Um, there are, there's a question as well about um, if we need help identifying things. Uh, yes, you can leave it blank. Um, the other option is to, if you don't know what it is, if you know it's a bird at least, uh, write in bird. Because there are, there are people on iNaturalist in the community that are expert birders. Um, they may not know plants, so they're not going to search all observations to, um, to find out, find bird observations. What they'll probably do is they'll check the identify section um, that you can get you from the menu bar in the top bar in iNaturalist. Um, and uh, they will just search birds. So it kind of helps at least if you can get it as specific as you can within your abilities. Um, that's better than just leaving it entirely blank. There's also a, an option to flag it to say needs ID, and you can you can click that um, option when you in the app or when you're adding an observation um, online. So that kind of flags it to other people that you would like help with the identification. Um, one thing as well, I would I should mention uh, I mentioned you know, this is great. And I've been out with my eight-year-old and my six-year-old taking photos. Um, they're getting pretty interested um, to, to find wildlife and to, to take photos of wildlife. So it is a great thing to do right now with, with kids to get yourselves uh, outside or at least looking at the windows and noticing what's around. Um, the other excellent option is uh, the Seek app, also created by iNaturalist. Um, it's a more a, a kid-friendly scavenger hunt type thing where uh, you go out with, it's, it's a separate app, Seek, um, and uh, it encourages you to take photos of different things. And once you've got a photo of a plant, you get a plant badge. It's, it's a bit like a scavenger hunt to find as many different species groups as you can. Um, and there's a few challenges in there. So it, it's a bit more user friendly for the, for the kids as well. Um, the image recognition software is in there. So what it does is it, it tells you if you've got a species that they can identify and will allow you to upload the, or to, to click, yes, this is the, the species that I've seen. Um, it also avoids making an account and having to have any location information stored. So that's a, that's a great way for people um, with young kids as well. Um, it is interesting if there's a question about, you know, do we want to post the common things? So something you see every day in your yard, like squirrels or chickadees, um, yes, I, I would say so, um, especially in this time, and maybe we're seeing an increase in squirrels. Um, the tricky part is going to be uh, whether we're seeing an increase in people taking photos of squirrels, not increase in squirrels, but um, there's a way looking at stats to be able to kind of parse those two things out. Um, I wouldn't say you necessarily need to take a photo of a squirrel every single day and add it up in there. Um, but you know, maybe the first one you're seeing of a season, for example, or a few, if you haven't taken a photo of, the, of a squirrel, or if there's a way to tell how many squirrels you've seen around, um, uh, you can also add that in the comment section um, of your observation to say, if you take a photo of a squirrel and say, oh, I've, I know there's about seven or eight different kinds of squirrels in the general vicinity because I've seen that many at the same time. Um, the other interesting thing it can do is to, to, to add in kind of observations over time. So 
um, if you have a, uh, a same tree that you take every time or you take a photo of it a certain time every year or every six months to just you know see the change over time and how the growth and all that you could you could do it that way and it will tag the same photo um, in that location you can see it change over the years um, uh, question also a question about photos and this kind of also goes back to um, common species um, uh, if you take a better phone on a different day, um, it should no, it should not be used to replace the first uh, photo that you took like a week ago. Because for one, it might be a different individual, even if it is, you know, a squirrel, and you're like, well, I'm pretty sure it's the same one. Um, it should be a new observation on its own. Um, that way, we can kind of compare, you know, individual photos, and we're not we're not backdating things it just makes it a lot simpler um, one thing you could do is you could create a new observation and then delete your original one if you really don't like the photo of that you can create your new observation with this good photo delete the old one and just leave the one up there I, I'd say that's much better uh, uh, approach um, okay I, I see if a question and maybe I'll just end with this one because it's it's a good a bit of a good um, uh, a good topic, uh, some, sometimes a little bit uh, um, uh, aversive to some people, is, is looking at roadkill. Um, yes, I agree. Some roadkill photos are quite gross. Uh, most people don't want to take these. Um, we, we don't really want to remove these photos because they are an occurrence of something that was there. So for example, uh, our turtle project in Eastern Ontario, um, any occurrence of a Blanding's turtle in Ontario uh, can trigger regulate or habitat regulation. So it can actually help protect the wetland uh, near which, which the turtle was found. And this does go for dead turtles as well. So the assumption is that if there's a roadkill turtle, turtle crossing the road, um, then there's, there is habitat suitable there that the turtle was moving through. Um, also what it does, and this is part of our work as well, which is actually a great success story for some of our work, um, we, part of our turtle project was actually trying to find these hot spots of road mortality. So we were actually trying to find, uh, we actually were doing surveys for road killed turtles, well, ideally alive, but unfortunately we're finding many more dead ones uh, on when we're, doing, when we're doing road surveys. Now, based on the data that we had, we actually have been able to target and identify several hot spots. So these spots where more turtles are killed on roads um, because of vehicles. And, and not surprisingly, these are some of the more busy roads uh, in the area. So there's more traffic, more uh, higher volume. So turtles are more often getting hit. From this work, we actually have uh, worked with the Ontario Ministry of Transportation. And last uh, fall, they have um, putting, put up mitigation, so fencing that directs these turtles to culverts now underneath the road instead of over top, which will, um, and it's proven to work, will reduce the number of turtles that are, uh, that are hit on roads. So despite these being you know, not pleasant to be looking at, um, maybe there's a way that the system can flag those in a sense where um, it could you know let the observer know before they click or the person looking before they click through to see a you know, close-up of a, of a roadkill animal um, but it really provides useful information and actually a real conservation action that's come out of specifically turtles on roads and we've looked through iNaturalist to help find us and help add to our database which we've been able to actually save other turtles from from being hit on roads um, so this summer, now that the mitigation is, is installed, we're going to go back out and survey those areas to see what kind of a difference that's made. Um, so it's, it's a good example of how, you know, and everybody, anybody can take a photo of, of you know, roadkill, unfortunately. Um, and even if you don't know what it is, it, it does help us to conserve the wildlife that is, that is in, that are in those areas. Um, so it's a good, you know, a good option for thinking about how, how we can, you know, any observation, whether you're an expert or an amateur, uh, can contribute to conservation, and we can use that information to help uh, help the species that are around us. Um, so I think this is a good place to end at, to think about where this data can go, um, how it can be uh, used for conservation, but how it can also be used for all of us in this time of you know, maybe being cooped up inside more than we'd like. Um, think about looking around your your property from balconies, 
uh, where it's safe to do so, go for a walk and, and you'll be surprised, I think, what you, what you notice um, singing around you uh, or flying around or, or running across, your, across the road or across your property. Um, and by all means, upload it to iNatural so we can all appreciate it and uh, make use of this, this information and maybe have a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, have, bring this as, a, as some extra incentive during these, these times where we're cooped up a little bit. So I want to thank everybody for joining. Also to know that we will actually have recorded this and um, this recording will be available on our website. Um, again, uh, if you Google CWF webinars, you'll be able to find the website there. Uh, I can also send this around to everybody who registered through Eventbrite, which is all of you that have joined. Um, I'll send around the link once we get that up to the recording. Um, I also see a bunch of questions in here that I haven't been able to get to, so apologies, but thank you. Um, I'll, I'll still be able to access these after the fact, and I'll, I'll browse through them and see if there's anything um, burning that I can maybe um, send around as well. That, uh, that's a common thing. So with that, uh, I wish everybody a good end of your day, and uh, keep in mind um, some resources at, at cwf-fcf.org. Um, and the webinar coming up on uh, Wednesday on, on wildlife friendly gardening. Have a good, uh, good rest of your day.